morning, Williams. Welcome to the planet. Welcome to existence. Everyone's here. Everyone's here. Everybody's watching you now. Everybody waits for you now. What happens next? What happens next? Dare you to move? Dare you to move? Dare you to leave? yourself up off the floor dare you to move dare you to move like today never happened today never happened Welcome to the fallout. Welcome to resistance. The tension is here. The tension is here. Between who you are and who you could be. Between how it is. Should be, yeah. Dare you to move? Dare you to move? Dare you to lift yourself up off the floor? Dare you to move? Dare you to move? taking me back that long ago. Welcome to chapel, everyone. Man, come on, guys. Welcome to chapel. I am so glad to see you here and mask up. Uh, my name is Ryan Putman, and I am uh, the interim campus minister, among many other things, here at Williams. It is my joy to uh, welcome you to chapel and to invite up Jackie King, who is our speaker today. And um, just because we don't want introductions to get boring, uh, I've decided to play a little lightning round of questions with Jackie. And uh, I am a theology professor, so I'm going to ask her some very difficult theological questions. Are you guys okay with that? Okay, you're okay with that? All right. <laughs> All right, it's the mask. I can't ever tell what they're, what they're thinking. All right, they're it's kind of creepy, actually. All right. 
So first tough theological question. What's your favorite breakfast cereal? Oh, I don't do cereal. I don't do breakfast. Does everybody do breakfast? I don't do breakfast. So uh, if I had to pick one, Raisin yes. Bran you Crunch. You have to pick one. Crunch. It has to be the crunch, not just regular Raisin Bran because then it gets okay, soggy and gross. Okay, Raisin Bran Crunch, all right. Is that acceptable to you guys? All right, no, <laughs> yeah. That's. Okay, what superpower would you rather have, invisibility or super strength? Ooh, uh, let's be invisible. I think I'd be invisible. All right, sneaky, all right? Yeah. Who has it easier, men or women? D duh, men. <laughs> all right. I've never gotten out of a speeding ticket for Girl crying, power. so just want to put that out there. <laughs> Do you ever post pictures of your food on Instagram? All the time, yes. All right. How annoying are vegans to you on a scale of 1 to 10? Vegan? Yeah. I'm all about meat. So I wouldn't say they're annoying, but I couldn't do it. So okay, who right. is it? Who's so a you're vegan? A 10 and Bill they're not annoying. annoying. Okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. That's inside joke. I'm sorry. Okay. I love right. you, vegan. You, you are on, you're going to be on a marooned on a desert island, and you can take one book besides the Bible with you. What is it? Ooh. Um. I'm a nerd. So it would probably be some kind of theology book. Or Elizabeth Elliot. I dig okay. her. Elizabeth Elliot or theology. You should have stuck with the first answer. Yeah. Theology book Sorry. is good. Okay. Sorry. I'm a nerd. All right. <laughs> We're going to test your nerdiness now. What is the capital of Rhode Island? Providence. Providence. Is that All right. right? Do you believe right? okay. in Providence? Yes. Right answer. Okay. Thought you were going predestination. Right. <laughs> On a scale of 1 to 10, how annoying do you find country music? Uh, which is the most annoying? One or ten? Ten is yeah, the, ten most. Being the most. Annoying. Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> yes. All right. So there we are. Okay. All right. <laughs> Halloween candy or Thanksgiving turkey? Turkey all the way. All right. Star Wars or Harry Potter? Potter. Neither. Okay. No, neither. That's acceptable. <laughs> you can't I know, say neither on this next choice. Though. Okay. Kanye or Taylor Swift? Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite Bible verse. That's so churchy. Um, I don't I have one. I don't have one. I love Philippians. Can I do the whole, all the verses? The whole book of Philippians the is whole your favorite Bible verse. Got it. All right. How will you celebrate the end of COVID-19? Tacos. Tacos. That's it. Okay. Yeah, tacos. Tacos. I eat tacos during COVID-19, so personally. <laughs> Cilantro, yes or no? Yes. All right. Excellent. On my tacos. Favorite Disney princess? Um... Who are the princesses? I would say <laughs> uh, Simba. I like Simba. I like the Lion King. <laughs> Simba's the king. <laughs> He's a king. He's literally the Lion King. <laughs> We're not that kind of school, okay? <laughs> All right. Favorite vacation destination? The beach. The beach. Okay. Can you call the hogs in a British accent? No, I'm a UT fan, oh, so I do not ooh, call the hog. How do you guys feel about that? I know. That's the, okay. The All glares. Right. Oh, I got one. Can we be friends there's, too? There's, Yay! There's, oh, yeah, Three, there we go. four. All right, there we go. All we've right, got. You guys we've got a group. Out of school. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. How can folks from Central Arkansas find out more about Second Conway? Um, you can go to mysecond.family and go check us out online. Awesome. Yes. And tell us a little bit about your ministry calling, what it is that you do, Jackie. Oh, geez, what do I do? Um, technically, I lead the ministry to women at our church, but I also get to go around and teach the Bible, which is a huge joy. And I get to hang out with college students from UCA and Central there in Conway. So it's really fun. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you so much for having being me. <laughs> with this. She's going to be great. We look forward to hearing from her. Now, take the band, let's go back to worshiping the Lord. Come on, you guys. Let's stand and give praise to God this morning. Singing, he's the Lord of all creation. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, the heavens are your tabernacle, 
glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders, God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of heaven and earth. Lord of Seeks your face, oh 
read you guys a scripture right now. This is from 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, it says, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at last, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this imperishable body must be put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the message this morning. We're going to sing this next song. It's called Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery. Come behold the wondrous mystery. Come behold the wondrous mystery. He the perfect Son of Man. In His living, in His striving, never trace nor stain of sin. See the truth.
unravel me with the melody you surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no longer For I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. For I am a child of God. We are yours. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. And I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. Sing it out. I'm no longer slaves fear for I am a child of God I'm no longer slaves fear for I am a child oh, oh. One of the implications of this song that we love to, that we love to sing, is that he splits the seas and we can walk through it. And I have a truth that I have a fear. I have a fear of failure. I have a fear of giving up. I have a fear of unworthiness at times. I didn't start the semester how I felt like I should have. Mr. Simon here made a bad grade there. And, and fear can keep in your mind 
telling you that it's not for you when God has called you to it. God gave the Israelites a promise and he split the sea so they can walk through so they wouldn't have to face their past. God has given you this, this promise. God has given you a hope and a future that you will succeed. I know I'm not the only one. You will succeed in everything that you do. He will split the seas so you can walk through it. And he's going to drown that fear, that year of depression, of anxiety. He's going to drown that in his love. He's going to drown what you used to be, uh -huh. your past self, your tormented self. He's going to drown it in his love. That's his truth. So, Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for the truth of your word. That you are near to us. That you've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor received begging for bread. That you would supply all our needs according to your riches and glory. That you have come that we may have life and life more abundantly. God, remove the fear, every ounce of fear. That, tend, that sometimes we tend to overlook and feel like we're not afraid of anything. And help us to submit every fear, every thought that seeks to exalt itself above your knowledge and your wisdom to bring it, send it to you and allow you to make it beautiful. Allow you to change it to confidence, to know who we are, children of the Most High King, a royal priesthood, chosen generation, called and chosen, for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Tate and worship team. I appreciate you so much. So much talent. Um, good morning. How are you? You okay? You awake? Nope, you're not. It's cool. Let's just start off being truthful. Um, I am Jackie, like we said, and I'm really excited to be here. I was actually supposed to be here last February, and I came down with the flu the day before I was supposed to come spend some time in chapel with you guys. So I have been looking forward to this for a really long time, and I'm glad that it's finally here. Um, I love Bible school. Like I said earlier, I'm a little bit of a nerd, and a lot of what God did in my own story and in my own life was during my time at Bible school, and believe it or not, the school I went to was even smaller than this, so, um, and there were not as many girls, so I love that there's so many women here, and um, I know that, at least for me, chapel was used for catching up on homework, so those of you that are looking down, I know you're not working on your Bibles, I know you're working on the assignments that are due later this afternoon, it's cool, I will take it personal. Um, so the year just started off, right? Like, y'all just kind of getting into the rhythm of classes starting and everything, I am a pretty big extrovert, always have been. My nickname in elementary school was Chatterbox, and I always got in trouble for talking. So when I think of the beginning of school, I think of introductions, and much like um, earlier, you found out just a bunch of random things about me. And here's what's interesting about introductions and meeting new people and starting new classes and kind of being put in different situations is that there's an automatic reaction to like when I say I'm Texan. Like, for some people, that's like, ugh, gives me the gag reflex. Please don't raise your hand because you'll hurt my feelings. Um, but, you know, when I say Texan, there's a little bit of a, a response there. Some of you may not care. Some of you may hate Texas. Some of you might be from Texas. And so it might bring, like, some love and joy to your heart. Um, some of you, whenever I say I'm a taco addict, you may say that's a weird thing to be addicted to, but it's true. Like, it's absolutely tacos all the time. If there's ever an option, I want tacos with cilantro. Um, and so I'm a taco addict. And then I know that this one evokes some emotion because I heard it earlier. When I say I am a legit, probably number one Taylor Swift fan, um, just the response that some of you, I see some of you shaking your heads right now, like it's rude. Um, she is like, I have never, and this is the funny thing, um, I became a lead pastor's wife at 28. We had done ministry just with students and young adults and stuff before that, but at 28 I became a lead pastor's wife, and I have never felt so in tune with another woman 
than with Taylor Swift. And like the Shake It Off song, I would literally put on repeat just over and over because there were church member people I was mad at and like just all these things. And so I would just literally be in my car driving with the windows down, screaming Shake It Off. And I'm like, this is my mantra. Like this is my girl. I know her, we're friends. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's different emotions, there's different things, even in what you thought of me before I even said a word, right? You probably had some thoughts about me. You had some judgments I will throw out there. You had some maybe kind of preconceived ideas of what I would talk like or what I'm gonna be like. And that all comes with an introduction. I'm meeting you for the first time today. You're meeting me for the first time today. And yet there's already kind of this premise, right? That there's a little bit that we know about each other, although I don't really know too much about you. And so what I think is interesting about Taylor Swift is that she kind of says things the way that it is. And that's kind of what I like about her. And I want to share with you a quote that she actually wrote to fans. You may not like her. You're not allowed to not like her. It's cool. But I'm wondering if this is maybe a truth that you have seen as well. She wrote to her fans in a letter entitled, Here's Something I've Learned About People. She writes, We think we know someone, but the truth is that we only know the version of them that they have chosen to show us. Would you agree or disagree? Okay, got some head shakes. This is the first generation that will be able to look back on their entire life story documented in pictures on the internet, and together we will all discover the after effects of that. Ultimately, we post photos online to curate what strangers think of us, but then we wake up, look in the mirror at our faces, and see the cracks, scars, and blemishes, and we cringe. That's not really something you put in an introduction, right? Like whenever somebody comes up to you and says, hey, who are you? I would think some of the ways that you would probably describe yourself is, oh, well, I'm a freshman. How, how many of you are freshmen? All right, because you're required to be here. Is that a thing? Like a freshman or <laughs> That's why there's so many. I'm glad you're here. Um, some of you may say, I'm a junior. I'm a senior. Some of you may say, I'm a um, Bible major. Or I'm not really majoring in anything. I'm playing sports. Um, I mean, there's just so many ways that you would introduce yourself. But I don't think you would introduce yourself or label yourself with the way of, well, I look in the mirror and I cringe in the morning. Right? Like nobody starts off the conversation that way. And if you do, you're typically like, eh, you know, like, I don't, I don't know about that. But what I found interesting, so I kind of threw it out. I work with our college ministry back home at Church in Conway. And so I threw it out to them. I said, hey, let me know, like, can you share with me, especially in this COVID season and we're sitting here with masks and like all of our schedules are kind of uneasy because we don't know, like, do we get to stay? Do we get to go? Are we friends? Are we not friends? And so I wanted to hear from them, how would you label, how would you describe yourself in this season? And I know y'all are more spiritual than them and more put together. And so hopefully this will make you feel better. But this is what they said. These are their words. They will label themselves as lonely, stressed, overwhelmed, incompetent, isolated, scared. Anybody? A little bit? So today we're going to look in the Bible at a girl that I think I have so much in common with. Like I'm thankful she's in the Bible. I'm thankful there's a girl in the Bible that we're going to talk about because I'm a chick preacher and that's what we do, right? We, we preach the girls. Um, so I'm thankful that she's in the Bible. I'm thankful that we're going to be looking at her story because I resonate so much with her. And I'm wondering maybe you might resonate with her too at the real label not the surface label. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 16. And as you're turning there, do you have Bibles? I hope you have Bibles. Pull them out, even if it's on your phone. Um, Genesis 16. And let me kind of set up the story for you. So um, all of you in Old Testament survey, I'm not sure that you've gotten here yet, but we're talking about the Abrahamic covenant, right? So we have this guy, Abram, who God has gone to and has promised essentially that he's going to have tons and tons of kids, right? He's going to have tons of babies, um, as many as the stars in the sky, sands on the ground. Have y'all heard this story? I hope, right? Like he's going to have a lot of kids. Problem is he's old and his wife is old. I'm fuzzing. Sorry. Um, and so they kind of have this like promise given to them by God. And then they're sitting around like, 
this isn't going to happen. There's no way this is, like, you're old. You're really wrinkly, dude, and you're even more wrinkly. Like, how are you going to birth a kid, right? And so Genesis 16 is kind of where we're going to pick up to where Sarai, Abram's wife, concocts this plan because all women have a plan. Do we not? We have a plan and a backup plan. That's the good thing about us. So let's pick up Genesis 16, verse 1. Are you with me? Say yes. Perfect. Thank you, all 10 of you. All right, here we go. Abram's wife, Sarai, had not borne any children for him, but she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her I can build a family. And Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar, her Egyptian slave, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan ten years. He slept with Hagar, and she became pregnant. When she saw that she was pregnant, her mistress, that's Sarai, became contemptible to her. That means she was rude, really rude, contemptible. Um, Verse 5, then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and when she saw that she was pregnant, I became contemptible to her. May the Lord judge between me and you. Six. Abram replied to Sarai, here, your slave is in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarai mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. Seven, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. So here's the really interesting thing, I think, with this girl, Hagar, and how she is described in the Bible. Did you catch it? Just in six verses, how many times she is called slave, my slave, Um, Let me go through it. So verse 1, it says she's owned as a slave. 2, go to my slave. Verse 3, Egyptian slave. Verse 5, I put my slave in your arms. Verse 6, here your slave is in your hands. Verse 8, Hagar, slave of Sarai. So what is she? A slave. I mean, over and over and over again. So anytime the word of God is like repeating really close together, you want to kind of hone in on that. So the drumbeat of this text is that Hagar is property. She's not a friend. She's not a neighbor. She's not a wife. She's not somebody that they care for. She is a means to an end. So over and over and over again, you have this word slave to where her label, the way she would introduce herself is not, hey, I'm Hagar from Egypt, or hey, I'm Hagar, I like tacos, or hey, I'm Hagar, um, I don't know, I like fill in the blank. It's, hey, I'm Hagar and I'm owned. I'm property. I don't have a voice. I'm the means to an end of their plan. Have you ever felt that way? That like something has happened that you don't have control, I don't know, COVID maybe, to where you are forced into a situation and there is so much change and you have no say into how it goes. And that is the very thing that labels you. That is the very thing that is kind of directing your steps, directing your days, directing what you do in the moment. And she was nothing more than a means to an end. Part of my story is that I don't know my biological dad. My dad actually abandoned me. I have no idea who he is outside of his last name. And so that has been a pretty definite line in my story. It's kind of been a thread as I've grown up and even into adult ages and and just trying to deal with that. But what's interesting is I didn't go up to people and say, hey, I have abandonment issues because who wants to do that, right? And so what I did was I took that and I turned it into like, pursuing and and doing things really well. And so this fleshed out for me on the softball field. Are there any softball players in here? Yay. Oh, you're my people. Hey. Okay. I was a pitcher. I know you wouldn't believe it. I was a junk pitcher. I wasn't a fast pitcher because I'm short. Um, But I loved softball. Like softball was my game. And so every weekend I was on the ball field. Every opportunity after school, I was playing catch with my dad and getting better and better. And so my entire worth my entire pursuit week after week growing up was did I make the paper and did I make the announcements? Like I wanted to make sure I had the most strikeouts. I wanted to make sure that other colleges were looking at me so that I could be scouted. And then I had to, of course, make sure that my grades were up so that I could play, right? Because that's kind of a part of it too. 
And so I drove myself to work hard. I drove myself to make sure that I was the top pitcher in the league. And Katie Yarborough, the girl at the rival high school, I hated her. Never met the girl, but I did not like her because she was the one that we were kind of trading spaces in the paper, right? And so I just had to be better than Katie. And so this whole pursuit of trying to get on the college ball team happened. And I signed with UT Dallas. And you know what happened? I was the best. And then all of a sudden, I was like, the same. Like, I was around people that played just as good as I did. Like, they got recruited just like I got recruited. And so I had to up my game. So now it wasn't trying to get in the paper. Now it was trying to earn my spot. And so my whole worth, my whole value was if I got to start the next game. Or if the coach put me in because Stephanie was doing bad, then I needed to make sure I did better. Like my entire worth value was based on how well I did compared to others. And this didn't go away when softball was out of my life. You know what it turned into? My job, if I was beating everybody in my job, if I was the best mom. I mean, we had organic snacks and everything, right? Like we were doing it right. Like, I had to be the best. But here's the problem with that label or that idea is that there is always someone better. There is always someone that makes you feel smaller. And there's always kind of this disconnect in even if you are the best, you flat know it won't be for long. Right? And so this drive, this label, this hollowness in my soul of wanting to be a part, of wanting to be known, of wanting to not be left aside. And so I spent my entire life, even in moments to today, to where I am striving to be a part of something. I am striving to make sure that you know that I'm with you and you're with me and that you're not going to leave. And that is something that you cannot control. That is something that you will constantly chase after and then you will constantly be left disappointed. So going back to kind of my original question, if you and I were sitting at the cafeteria and I ask you, who are you? I don't want like the taco addict. I don't want where you're from. I want to know like, who are you? What's the thing inside that's aching? What's the label inside to where Hagar, our girl, is the slave? She's used. She's cast out. She's used for something and then she's thrown away. So much so that she just wants to run from God and them, right? So if I was looking at you mask off and it's just you and I and I'm looking you in the eye and I say, who are you? What label comes to mind? What are you chasing? What are you pursuing? What consumes your thoughts at night? It says that she was a slave. I think many of you probably struggle a bit with trying to prove yourself. I think we're all trying to prove ourselves, right? Either you don't want to be your parents or you're trying to make the grade for your parents that you're going to be on the team and you're going to be the best. And so you're going to prove that you belong here. You have your life mapped out. You're going to get it done. Some of you, it's probably like many of us right now, it's this overcoming fear and anxiety and maybe even depression. That there's all of these questions that well up inside of you of, Am I doing this right? Am I going to be okay? Are they going to be okay? What if they aren't? What if I'm not? And so it's all of these what if questions that kind of swarm through our head and our hearts and it leaves us in this state of knowing nothing is stable. Nothing is okay. Nothing is good. And then I'm sure some of you, just like me, it's that loneliness. You make sure you are in the picture. You make sure that you are at the gatherings. You make sure that you are trying to get to know all of the people. But when you lay your head down to sleep, you think, nobody knows me. They know the things like Taylor so said that they put out there for everyone to see. But nobody actually knows me. Anybody? But it doesn't stop in verse 6. Does it? Let's look at 7. I get back to my Bible. Verse 7. Are you still awake? Oh, look, your hands. Okay, good. Here we go. 7. The angel of the Lord found her. If you like to mark in your Bible, which I hope you do, I hope you like star that, rainbow it, whatever makes your eyes go to it. That the Lord found 
her. This wasn't like a happenstance, like the angel of the Lord's walking through the wilderness, like, oh, Hagar, how's it going? You know, what are you doing over there by that spring? You getting some water? It's an intentional pursuit because he was going after her. He found her by a spring in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. That on the way to Shur more than likely means she's trying to go back home. She's trying to go back to Egypt. She's been rejected. She's been mistreated. She's been put off. And she's running away. And she's trying to go back home. Have you ever lost anything, like, valuable? Like your keys? Anybody do that? I do that, like, every other day. Okay? Two. Cool. All right. Um, Or, like, a piece of jewelry or your homework. Anybody? Yeah. Y'all are so responsible, okay, if you're not losing anything. How many of you have, like, lost a kid? Like a little brother, little sister, you're like, what? Okay, I have, so I'll just go ahead and throw that out there. Mom of the year right here. Um, I want to show you a picture of my youngest. This is Amos. The day before school started, you can't see on the screen, but that kid gave himself a black eye the day before school because he was running and decided to run into the counter. And so he's got like this huge black eye um, in his first day of school pictures. He's really fun. He is our youngest and we adopted him from Ethiopia. Um, He's been home about five and a half years. And so what's interesting about Amos is we fought so hard to get him home and now I am fighting him literally every day. Like he's our crazy kid. Like he's got so much energy. He's so just, um, he's running into cabinets and countertops. Um, That's what he's doing. And so when he was little, I literally had to keep my eye on him all the time because he would just go like target was a means for him to like have an obstacle course and so he's going to go through you know the kitchen aisle see what he can kind of break but not break but make a big crashing noise and there was one time we were in target and i'm trying to get clothes for my oldest Haddon. and so i take a shirt and i put it up next to Haddon to see if it's the right size right and then as much as i like turn around he is gone like kid is gone like a sly you don't hear anything and so I'm like, great, where is Amos? So I look to my middle son and I'm like, where's Amos? And he's like, I don't know. I was looking at this dinosaur over here, you know? And so we start looking all over Target, like cannot find the kid. So if you've learned or like lost anything, you know, like your heart starts going really fast and you think, oh my gosh, he's gonna, he's like gonna run out or somebody's gonna steal him because he's so cute. I mean, look at those dimples, you know? And then like, you're just thinking through all of the things. And then on the other second of that, you're like, I'm gonna kill him. Like, why am I doing this again, right? Like, we have talked about this. You are supposed to stay by mom. Where are you going? And so all of us, me and the brothers, we're like looking around. And then finally we get down low enough to where Amos would be, you know, he's like three. So finally he goes, out from underneath this four-way of clothes. I don't know how he squeezed himself in there. And he goes, ta-da, you found me. And so I grab him and I give him a hug really quick. And then I whisper in his ear and I say, if you ever do that again, I'm going to spank you so hard in front of all of these people. <laughs> but there's this, there's this feeling of relief, like, okay, he's mine. He's with me. It's okay. He didn't get stolen. Although right now, I don't know that that would be horrible. You know, maybe they would do better. But like, there's this relief of, okay, I've got him. And then he thinks it's a game, right? He's like, hey, you know, I I beat you kind of thing. That's similar to what's happening here. That there is a pursuit, there is a chase, there is a looking, and he knows exactly where she is at. He knows she's running. He knows that she's been mistreated. He knows all of these things that we're about to see. And in the Bible, it says that he went and found her. So many times God can be presented as like this big, cosmic, far away. He's just watching, waiting for you to like screw up kind of God. And the reality is scripture tells us over and over again that he is chasing hard after you. The Lord, the angel of the Lord found her. For you girls in here, I think this is really cool. This is the first instance in the scriptures to where a woman is, is, well, hold on. Let me go back. This is the first time in scripture that the angel of the Lord appears, and it's to a woman. Okay, let me sit there. So the first time the angel of the Lord, more than likely being Jesus, you know, theophany, if you've heard that thing, that the first time, and he displays himself, he shows up, he has a conversation with a slave, non-Jewish, because Jews aren't there yet, right? Foreigner, slave. Okay? 
And then we also get to see in a little bit that she is the first one that gets to name God. And naming in the Bible is kind of a big deal if you haven't learned that yet, okay? So he found her. Let me show you this really quick as we kind of wrap up. Verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. He said, listen to how many times it says he said. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I'm running away from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, go back to your mistress and submit to her authority. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring and they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived and will have a son. He said, he spoke to her. So there's this dialogue going on between God and and the outcast, between God and the slave, between God and the one that is running and the God of the universe that literally knows everything. So the first thing is that he speaks to her and notice he asks a question first, right? He says, hey, Hagar, where are you going and where are you coming from? Did he know both of those answers? Yes or no? Yes. But he starts with a question, and I love this example, and I think we see it in Jesus' life all the way along, like the woman at the well, the disciples, that Jesus asks really good questions. He doesn't come into a conversation and say, this is how you fix this, this is what you need to do, take this plan A, B, C, and then you'll be fine. And instead he asks a question, which I think shows he's trying to get to who you are, not the right thing to do, right? So the first thing is that, he speaks. The second thing is he hears. Check this out. Verse 11. The angel of the Lord said to her, you have conceived and will have a son. You will name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. He will settle near his relatives. Not really something you put on a birth announcement, right? But his entire name means that God heard her. So first he's dialoguing with her. He's having an entire conversation. And then she is to name her child that God, what? Hears. So not only is he speaking, he's listening. And then let's check out what keeps going. 13. So she named the Lord. This is the part where she gets to name him who spoke to her, you are El Roi. For she said, in this place, I have actually seen the one who sees me. That is why the well is called Be'er Lakai Roi. My, Greek, or my Hebrew is not awesome, sorry. Okay? It is between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave birth to Abram's son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, notice the slave part isn't there anymore, Ishmael, God who hears. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore God who hears to him. So here's where I kind of want to get like rubber hits the road, okay? Because you're like, all right, why are we talking about her? Like what, what is all of this? He speaks, he hears, he sees. An Egyptian in the middle of the desert, all alone, running away. Who feels discarded, who feels alone, who feels helpless, and who's trying just to get back to some kind of normalcy. I don't know about you, but I can, I can totally relate to Hagar in this season. That life is hard. That relationships are hard right now that you don't know where you stand. Like, are we friends? And we kind of like got ripped apart last semester and then we weren't able to see each other. And so where am I with you? And I don't know about this degree. Like I was supposed to have all of these classes and now I don't know what to do anymore. Like I was supposed to have an internship and it got canceled. So what does that mean for my job? I mean, like you can, you can create all kinds of what am I supposed to do with this? Like I feel alone. I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I am running from the very fears that are constantly going on in my head and I can't run fast or hard enough. And just like Hagar, there is a God who is chasing you down, 
who wants to find you, who wants to speak to you, who wants to hear all of those fears and doubts and worries, and he wants you to know that he absolutely sees you. It's funny when he asks, like, would you be invisible or would you be, um, what was it, all-powerful or whatever? It's interesting because I think, honestly, there's a lot of times to where I feel so completely invisible. So invisible in a room full of people. And it's because they know kind of those labels or they know those things that I project out to the world that I want them to know about me. But when I'm quiet and when I'm still, it's not a good place some days. And so in those moments, we need to be reminded that we have a God that is chasing you down. Some of you are running as hard as you can away from him. Some of you think you've got this thing completely figured out. You're just going to make the grade. You're going to do the sport. You're going to, you know, accomplish whatever it is, get out of here, and then you're going to get out and make a lot of money, you know, and, and all of the things. And I really do truly hope that works out for you. I really do. But I can tell you right now, you can chase and you can pursue, and in a moment in your life, there is going to be a day where you feel like you're in the wilderness, completely alone, knowing not what to do. And I hope you hear through this scratchy microphone my voice in that moment saying, he totally wants to speak with you. He hears and knows everything that you are saying and not saying. And he sees you when nobody else does. He did it to a slave on the backside of a desert. And he's doing it today. So I want to give you just a couple application points because that's what teachers are supposed to do. And then I want to show you kind of a cool video that I've got. So here's just some points if you want to scribble them down. God is faithful when people are not. God is faithful when people are not. I'm sure many of you in my generation and then because y'all are lower in the generation, our generation is marked by brokenness, by broken homes, by broken stories, by broken things that have happened to us. And so over and over again, in church work, in the secular world, you are going to experience that people are going to hurt you, that they're going to try their best and they're going to fail, that you're going to try your best and they're going to fail. And one of the biggest lessons I have learned in my pursuit of not feeling alone, of not wanting to feel that sting of abandonment, is that God is the only completely faithful one that he is faithful when people are not. Two, in seasons in the wilderness, sit with God. Listen to him. Speak to him. See him. Dig into scripture and be reminded of how God has chased broken, jacked up people just like you and I all throughout these pages, and he's still doing it now. And three, join the mission. I think one of the greatest joys that I have in leading women is being able to sit at a coffee table and to be able to declare that God is chasing them down. That through tears, they're telling me about whatever hard things have happened in their life, and I get to be a part of sharing this story that, yes, that's hard. Yes, that stinks. But there is a God that sees and cares, and he has invited us on this mission to be hope, to be love, to be caring and to see people, to not walk by them, to not just go through the checkout line and speak nothing to them. Have you noticed how like shocked people are when you ask them, how's your day? Do y'all do that? You should. I mean like at Target, cause the girl knows me. I mean, I'm there like every other day, right? Without my kids now. Um, and so I'm like, how's your day? And she like does a double take and she's like, excuse me, how are you? Because we're, we're in such a fast-paced culture, nobody cares how you are anymore, right? And so what if we slowed down and we remembered that the people in front of us are people that need to be, what? Seen? Heard? Spoken to? I mean, those are three simple things that you can just take the gospel places. To actually treat humans like humans. Right? Right? So God is faithful when people are not. In seasons in the wilderness, sit with God. Enjoy the mission. 
I showed you a picture of Amos. Um, he is seven now. He just turned seven in July. And as I was thinking about just closing this thing out and what it looks like to be chased, like I've never been chased by like an animal or anything like that. And then <laughs> I woke up this morning and I thought, I have the perfect illustration of this thing. Amos was abandoned in Ethiopia. His mom left him outside of a church. It's a lot like Bible times. And so he, she left him there. He was sick, probably close to being um, like about to die. And a police officer, a chick police officer, by the way, picked him up, took him to a orphanage and then was able to take him to the hospital and that kind of thing. And so his story, I remember whenever we got matched with him and his little picture came up, he was so chubby, like he was super malnourished, but they have like this protruding belly, you know, whenever they don't have all the nutritions and stuff that they need. And so he came over and he was in girl clothes. And I said, eh, I don't, I don't think this is my kid. Like I, we have a boy and they're like, no, it's, a, it, it, that's Amos. <laughs> they just don't have enough clothes. And so sometimes you get put in girl clothes and sometimes you get put in boy clothes. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, and so it was a year and two months, three months um, with our adoption with him to bring him home. And I remember the fight between governments and the Ethiopian government and the U.S. government and all of the paperwork and timelines and thinking, okay, we get to go get him and then we don't get to go get him. And just this long drawn out wrestle with the Lord of like, God, when are we going to get to bring our boy home? And I'm going to go ahead and have you start playing the video. And we got a call right after Christmas that we needed to hop on a plane by the end of the week. And so we got it. And this is the first time that we got to meet Amos King. Do you see his eyes? Do you see how scared he was? And like he was literally like clinging to my shoulders. And I'm clinging to him because he's finally in my arms after fighting so long to get him home. And only seeing pictures and only being oceans away. And then we finally had this moment to where I have my son and he is terrified. Who are these white people, right? Like, and they have teeth. And who's this guy that's like got this thing in front of me? I mean, he was scared to death and it took so long even just for him to be comfortable with us and like okay with spending time with us. And I think that's how we are with the Lord. I really do. I think he is coming and he is ready to wrap you up. He is ready to hold you and say, I love you. I am so glad to be with you. I cannot wait to share a whole new life with you. And we're kind of clinging on scared, not knowing what to expect, not knowing where we're going. But we've got a whole new life that he's ready to show us. And so here's what... You may be sleeping like halfway through, and that's cool, but here's what I want you to hear. And it may not be now. You may be fine now, and that's great. I hope you are. But if you're in a season of wilderness, if you're in a season of running, if you're scared, if you don't know what the future looks like and what life looks like, cling. Just cling because he's a good dad. He's such a good dad. And he loves you so much, so much more than you even know that he is willing to chase down an Egyptian slave in the middle of a desert to say, I see you, I hear you, let's chat, let's pray. 
God, I love you. We love your word. We love that there is comfort, that there is encouragement, that there is truth. And so God, I pray for these students. I pray for the one that is sitting in a pew right now that is trying to hold back tears, that has the lump in their throat that says, I feel alone. I feel like her. God, I pray that you would whisper to him. I pray you would scream to her how much you were after them. I pray that this week as they go through class and workouts and games and just all of the things that fill college life, God, I pray that there would be moments that it is so evident that you are chasing them down. I pray that they would see you just like Hagar sees you. I pray that they would cling even if they're scared. And I pray that they would trust that you are a big God who has come down to hear, to see, and to speak. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.